So every medical talk, or medical-related talk, really has to begin with Hippocrates. Um, there, are two, there are, in fact, two things, science and opinion, Hippocrates says. The former begets knowledge, and the latter, ignorance. And he said that, you know, five centuries uh, before the Common Era. But I would like to add, not always. And personalized medicine is one of those examples where what you people do, what we do, is, is critically important. So let me first talk about this personalized medicine thing. Um, it's, it's, Webster's defines it as. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's the, uh, as soon as he said that, I thought, oh crap, I got that slide right. <laughs> he defines it as the use of individual genetic information to prevent disease, to choose medicines, and make other critical decisions about health. And I'm going to argue that this is an entirely mystical, not a medical definition uh, in the course of this talk. So here, here's what I'm going to come to. Um, First, I want to talk about why this notion of personalized medicine, which is a terrible name, is not new. Secondly, I want to talk about what is the real science behind what's being claimed in the name of personalized medicine. And third, I want to kind of demonstrate where these people have made the slip into mysticism. Um, and I think that it'll be interesting for, uh, for this group in particular. And if not, blame it on the morphine. Okay, so going back to Hippocrates. So Hippocrates basically kind of pulled medicine out of the, the uh, initially pulled medicine out of the, the clutches of uh, the witch doctors, et cetera, and, and, and tried to put it on some kind of rational ground. In retrospect, we don't think it was that rational, but it was the first attempt. So he, he based it on the humors. Um, so the, everybody's familiar with yellow bile or choleric, uh, uh, black bile or melancholic, phlegm, phlegmatic, uh, blood or sanguine. So it was phenotype. He was, he was kind of defining phenotype in terms of medicine. So this was a step forward, even though, like I said, we laugh about it now, much like we'll laugh about chemotherapy in another 10 years. But it's, uh, it, it was a, um, a significant step. So, so let me do a little case study, because every once in a while I talk to doctors, and they like case studies, and it's kind of silly. So, um, so a patient comes in to see Hippocrates, and Hippocrates observes that, that he's sad, and has kind of low energy and is lugubrious, which I just like that word and had to get it on the slide. So, so the diagnosis, given the four humors, you know, with consult the medical dictionary, is a, a melancholia or an overabundance of the black bile. And so there's a treatment, and it includes dietary changes, usually not ones people liked, abstinence, usually not something people liked, and purging, definitely something most people didn't like. But if the patient got better, the diagnosis proved itself, and the humors went their merry way, and the, and the patient came back with the next round of whatever they had. So in a sense, Hippocrates was really doing personalized medicine. He, he grasped the centrality of human variability, or what was called idiosyncrasia. The idea was to have eucrasia, you know, the balance of the humors. Idiosyncrasia meant there was a bunch of different balances and a bunch of different people, and it was all kind of personalized to those folks. He also believed that this variability among folks in the balance of their humors uh, affected both the disease susceptibility and the therapeutic response to whatever, they, whatever therapy they were able to offer. And then he always emphasized that, that clinical practice must be personalized, even though he didn't use that word, to the phenotype. So personalized medicine, let's just start with that, is not really anything new. It's just a term that's taken on some additional meaning that we'll talk about. Um, so the humors continued for nearly two centuries. In fact, uh, this, you know, the rumor is George Washington was bled to death as a result of a humor diagnosis of various kinds. Um, strengthened by Galen, of course. Pa they, they kind of filled in phenotype various ways, tried to measure more things, so they would collect blood and urine and sweat and feces and test them, but uh, we're not talking quest diagnostics here. I'll just spare you some of the uglier details of the testing. Um, but the most fascinating thing was the humors really didn't explain everything, and so what fills in is a lot of other stuff, astrology or uh, theology, I, not really theology, but I call it praxis, the actual kind of odd religious practices. They, they played major roles, kind of filling in wherever ignorance remains. So. Hippocrates pushed the line a little further, but the whole back end still belonged to, to uh, woo-woo. So, 
And, and we see this pattern repeated several times as we go ahead. This is not going to be a history of the science of medicine, just a couple highlights. So, so Paracelsus um, uh, was an alchemist who turned to chemistry because in the town he was working in Basel, Switzerland, he noted that the miners who were inhaling these various chemicals were actually having fairly ill effects from them, and he was able to do kind of a controlled experiment and figure out it was due to the chemicals. Um, so he began to, to broaden the understanding in terms of environmental forces, not just what's going on inside your humors. Um, he started to realize there's such a thing as dosage. It's a little bit of a good thing is, is fine. Too much of a good thing is really bad. Um, but it was all steeped still in this kind of mystical alchemy, uh, alchemy language and uh, practice. But it was a step forward. Uh, Harvey, the experimentalist who kind of cut people up, was able to prove that, that Galen so understanding of how the humors fl flux through the body was wrong uh, just by demonstrating what the circulatory system did. But it still, like I said, took centuries to, to replace humor-based medicine. Leeuwenhoek um, kind of expanded beyond what the human eye could see. So what Hippocrates saw in the clinic in terms of his patient's appearance, there was like more to see. Um, the world within us and the world without. And, uh, but it, it expands what we could see but not necessarily what we could understand, but it pushed the line a little further. So this, this, I call it scalpel scopes in chemistry. It kind of is redefining phenotype. It's getting it richer, so we got a better observational sense and start to put together pieces and push back the line of ignorance a little bit. Um, and as a side note, it kind of, and this will become important later, it, uh, it, it co coalesced medicine around basically organ systems and stuff, which turns out is a terrible way to organize medicine. Um, but the line's getting pushed back. So uh, just leaping ahead um, to this century, but now we have the emergence of what's called real personalized medicine uh, as compared to the fake personalized medicine practiced by Hippocrates and many fine doctors throughout. This is a cover of Science from a couple years ago, the molecule or the breakthrough of the year about human genetic variability. Um, this new personalized medicine, this brave new world, is driven by technology, uh, the coming together of really good analytical tools with significant IT power to deal with the massive amounts of data. It's basically science-based, um, and it's hugely overhyped. 